one thing that I has been on my heart and mind uh, of recent and even, you know, it was mentioned in, in various ways this morning mm. is related to the power of God and the working power of God, mm. um, you know, in relation to communion and, and uh, God's, our, our participation or our invitation to be able to be partakers of the new covenant um, is in particular, you know, where my thoughts have been, not necessarily in relation to communion per se, but really in the power of the new covenant. Um, We know that this is something that was spoke of by the the prophets of old. Um, Familiar scripture would be that God would accomplish his will, not by the strength of man or by the might or power of man, Mm. but by the power of his spirit. And, you know, I think that when we think about the power of God and how God, whether that be exercises his power, um, manifests his power, um, gives stewardship of his power and the, the ensuing authority, the power of God never is is never outside or out of the bounds of God's authority or his order or his purposes. They are all bound together as one. When Jesus mentioned the new covenant, uh, not all manuscripts of the scriptures talk about it, but there, there are some variances there specifically <clears throat> in Matthew 26, uh, when Jesus instructed his disciples to go to, to prepare a place where they could share the Passover meal together. He says in verse 27, after breaking the bread, giving thanks, and he gave it to the disciples. This is in 26. He says, take and eat. This is my body. And then he continues in verse 27. He took the cup and gave, drink, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it all, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Um, you know, it would be maybe a, a, a little, uh, a, a cause for some alertness there on, on the part of the disciples for Jesus to say such a thing or to indicate such a thing. We know that this is not a foreign concept in the New Testament at all, because Paul in many different occasions calls it the new covenant. But I, you know, imagine the disciples at that point hearing Jesus make mention of something. There's a fulfillment that's taking place, but also a new order that's being put in place. <clears throat> the, the apostles also say that the, the law was not imperfect, but its weakness was in the flesh of man. because man was unwilling. And in many ways, incapable of fulfilling what the law demanded. And in its most basic truth, the law demanded death, death to self death to a former way of life. 
So rather than trying to imagine how difficult it was for a people or an individual to fulfill all of the the, the parts of the law, all of the pieces and rules and regulations that were in the law, which became beyond the capacity, especially up to the time of Christ. You know, Jesus told the Pharisees the very thing. You're trying to force the people to, to fulfill something that you yourselves can't even fulfill. And you've gone beyond the measure. And in going beyond that measure, you're, in a sense, you can't enter into the thing that you proclaim and you're keeping others from being able to enter into it as well. That is interesting to me in light of the, the strength and the knowledge and the efforts and the wisdom of man. That's the shortcoming that was seen in the law or not in the law itself, but in man's ability to fulfill it. But Jesus here comes and offers his own flesh and blood as what is meant to be given over for what he calls the new covenant. Now, we, among our own people and teachings, have not we we've also considered the new covenant to be correlated to the eternal covenant that God had for mankind. And I'm not trying to confuse much here. I want to get to a specific point. That being the power of the new covenant. What was instituted in the power of the, of the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because it, it became in him and through him, through his seed, a life of power. Now, power we typically equate to the supernatural or, or excuse me, like, like miracles, wonders, signs, healings. But one of the great powers of God that is overlooked by man is that power which transforms the man in himself in his inner man, that his heart and mind and soul are subdued. That's this hidden working power of the Holy Spirit. And yet man continues to imagine another another power, what power is, what it looks like, how it's fulfilled. And it's always in the outward manifestation, something that can be seen, heard, felt, experienced somehow. But never really looking into the heart. So, you know, Paul's words on, about this new covenant, and, and I want, you know, as we come, come to take communion together and to participate and partake, be partakers of this new covenant representative of a life of power, let's look at how Paul defined the difference, especially the glory of of the former compared to the glory of the latter. So second Corinthians chapter three. What's amazing to me about Paul, especially when he, when he begins to, in his letters, he talks about, how he taught and how he preached and what power that came from. He very clearly says, well, it's not like 
what everyone else calls a great man or a very powerful speaker or a very gifted ministry. He says, rather, you know, it was very, very simple. He said, I I would never boast anything but the cross. (laughs) Jesus Christ crucified. Now, that's the very thing that Jesus was talking about was the laying down of his life, the breaking of his body, the shedding of his blood. That sacrifice and in essence, truly the laying down of his life in that way is what opened up the new and living way for us. And as we have discussed before, Jesus didn't die so that we didn't have to die. Jesus died to show us the way of death unto the li- unto life so that we could be born again. The very truth that he was revealing when he was speaking to Nicodemus. Born anew. Born from above. From a different seed. Not by... The power of man in that, in that description, not by the will of a man or the consent of a man and a woman to have a child, but born from above of the seed of Christ, that life, this indestructible life, this life-giving life. That was the great differentiation between what Jesus said of what it meant to be a a, a child of Abraham and what the true seed of Abraham was. Who were the true Jews? And Paul brought further clarity to that, saying, God didn't say Abraham's seeds, uh, plural, meaning many. He said, Abraham's seed, one seed. And that our life in Christ is not separate from Christ's life from that one seed. So back here in 2 Corinthians... Paul starts the chapter talking about the fact that the believers, that they are the testimony. Verse 3 says, you show that you are a letter from Christ. The result, the fruit, the product of our ministry. Written not with ink, as in the letter of the law but with the spirit of the living God. And we know that the spirit is active and living, working, moving, not on tablets of stone. So now a direct reference back to the old covenant of the law, but on tablets of human hearts. And he says in verse six, he made us the apostles competent as ministers of a new covenant, literally priests activated in the service of God's holy temple in the heavenly realm. That's the kind of minister of a new covenant, not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now what I want to draw out here before continuing in the following verses is for us to take a moment to observe the efforts of good God believing people, specifically ministers and our own efforts 
through our own consumption, partaking of, learning of, and trying to put into effect the word of God. You know, there is a thought or an imagination that thinks that just because we, we agree with or we learn or we are able to teach the word of God that it is therefore activated in us. And I believe that the word of God carries on its own authority and power. But the glory of the new covenant is what the spirit is able to do by the strength and power of God, not by the will of man. You see, we, we see what God has put in front of us, what attainment that we are to have in Christ. And we still many times try to achieve that attainment by our own strength. If I do this enough, if I say this enough, if I believe this enough, if I agree with this enough, then it'll happen. But I would submit to you that it's far more, there's, there's far more of a spiritually natural creative power involved. So that what the old covenant was incapable of doing because of the weakness of man's flesh, there's the weakness of man's flesh. It's all in his own efforts. What it was incapable of doing, the new covenant is capable of doing. Why? Because it is an active working of God's power. And the empowerment comes not only through the agreement or consideration of or reading or memorization of the letter of the law. But by the creative working power of the spirit within. For us, the, much of the essence of this is, do we believe that God is able through that creative power to accomplish what he has set out to accomplish? And I'm not saying, let's not get into theological idealism or argument and think that that I mean that we don't have a part in that, but where our part is, is in our agreement with the spirit of God. The new covenants like the same kind of creative power that God used when he first created and things that did not exist came into existence jumping ahead a little bit in second corinthians chapter four look at the comparison that paul gives for god who said this is verse six in chapter four of second corinthians For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. So in the same way, God spoke this creative word of power. Made his light shine on our, in our hearts to give us light. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. In the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. 
to show. <laughs> wow. To show. Why has God given us? We all struggle with this. We all struggle with our, our shortcomings. Maybe our lack of progress to be able to overcome certain things. Why has God given us this vessel of clay in which it is to be worked out? To show that this all-surpassing power, it's from God, not from our knowledge, not from our own ability, not from our imagination, not even from our highest hope, because he will do far beyond all that we ask or hope by his power. That this all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. It doesn't come from anywhere inside of us. In light of this, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed. Anyone share that sentiment? Perplexed, not understanding yet, but not in despair. Persecuted by what? By the people of the world? Maybe. What about by the accusing spirits, the lying spirits? Definitely. But not abandoned. But not abandoned. Struck down. By who? By what? How about the mighty hand of God? But not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. Why? He showed us how to die. Why? So that the life of Jesus might be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. What does that mean? Jesus... <laughs> Peter told Jesus, or Jesus told Peter, you can't, you can't take this cup right now, but you will. You will drink of this cup. I'll show you the way so that my life can become the working, living power of your life, source of your life. We are given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in this jar of clay, this mortal body during this life. Because after this life, we will no longer have a mortal body. This life, right now, this is the way. So then, death is at work in us. But life is at work in you. He who raised Jesus also raises us with him. Verse 16, now and four, he says, Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly, where is this power really unleashed? Where is this mighty work really accomplished? <laughs> Through signs, wonders, miracles, healings, 
big ministries, big programs, many raised hands. Inwardly, inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen. I I could read this whole section of chapters, but let's jump back a little bit to the new covenant and the glory of the new covenant. Chapter 3, verse 7. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious. If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? How is it so much more glorious? Because of the creative power. For what was glorious has no no glory in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? So he talks about the veil that comes over the minds. When what? When they try to even receive this new, the promise of the new covenant with the, with the strength or the effort or the way that they receive the old covenant. He says it's like a blinder. It's a veil. But not when we turn to the Lord. What does that mean? When the Lordship of Christ Jesus is fully established in us. Then the veil is taken away. And in that place. The Spirit can reign. And where the Spirit of the Lord is reigning, ruling in us, then the word of the new covenant, the promise of the new covenant, becomes all lively and active. And there is freedom. And with this unveiled face, we then can reflect the Lord's glory. And we are transformed continually into his likeness with ever increasing glory. Comes from the Lord, from the source of his life, from his seed, by the spirit. He is spirit. This is the covenant, the new covenant in his blood that we partake of. We become partakers of it. We commit our lives or the laying down of our lives as Christ Jesus did. So that whenever we lay down our lives, He is faithful 
to raise us up in the newness and power of the life of Christ Jesus.